I think the primary goal of my photographs is to bring people into a world that doesn't really exist through my eyes, through my experience. You can walk as a, as a scale dimensional person through this little miniature world. I'm not so interested in scale model accuracy as much as sharing my little visions and fantasies with other people and by taking them there through my one-eyed camera, I'm therefore much more able to bring them with me. And I think that's kind of what speaks for my style, my brand. I think the public has a misconception of what a model railroader actually is. Um, I'm speaking for more than just myself, but we've all been led to believe or like to believe jokingly that they're funny little fat men with uh, striped engineer's caps and they run around with badges and do nothing but play with trains. But uh, heck, I'm here to tell you there's a lot of us out here that do like uh, women drinking beer and going camping on the weekends also. My equipment preferences revolve around two different kinds of cameras. First off, I like to use a two and a quarter square format. It's a twin lens reflex camera that gives me a large format negative size. It gives better resolution and I can get right down onto the model surface with the taking lens. And tripods, of course, are essential because my exposures are of usually up to a minute in length, so you need the steadiness of a tripod. The other kind of camera I like to use is a single lens reflex with interchangeable lenses. The workhorse of my lens stable, so to speak, is the 55 millimeter macro because that'll allow me to do some real close portraiture of locomotives and the figures. And the other two that I use uh, most frequently are the 24 to 48 millimeter zoom and the 70 to 210 millimeter telephoto for special instances. Most of the predominant problems I encounter in shooting miniatures of this nature are making sure everybody is where he belongs. And what I mean specifically is you will spend hours taking three or four exposures, getting it all properly balanced and all the lighting, and you'll get the thing back, the, the chrome's back, you project them, you take a look, and oops, one of your little scale men tipped over and he's in the ditch upside down, or a tree's cockeyed, or you've got a telephone pole coming out of the top of the locomotive. So these are the little frustrations that you have to really take time to look for I think I've been very fortunate in that uh, my career with Disney, some 11 or 12 years now, has also paralleled my interest in the hobby. They feed each other back and forth, forth and back quite a bit. I work at Disney with people like Ward Kimball and Harper Goff and other well-known train aficionados. They've given me quite a bit of information and interest in the hobby. And likewise, my hobby helped me get into Disney and in that I was into the world of miniatures, fantasy, the other than the real and these two things worked back and forth and continue to do so to this day. Well, I feel there's two kinds of depth of field that are most important in model rare photography. One of them is the one that I've kind of shifted away from, what I call the infinite depth of field. Whereas if you feel, people have the perception that when you scale yourself down to take a model scene as though you were there as a real person in that model, that you need infinite depth of field. Everything from your toes all the way to ad infinitum should be in focus. And in the real world, that doesn't happen. We have fall off. The, the near ground is out of focus. The far ground is a little soft, just on a normal exposure. So what I try to do is stay away from these, these F128 three-hour exposures so the whole picture is so sharp you can cut your finger on it and go for something a little more in what would be the F8 range in real-world photography. So you have a little fake falseness, a little uh, softness in the foreground, a little bit in the background, and you kind of... Just like um, focusing on a portraiture, you want to throw a little out of focus, well this thing you let fall into normal perspective. And I think we get a much more realistic picture. Something I found in setting up a scene, getting my uh, bracketing and exposure and all that set up, the most important thing for me, the most critical first step is to take the camera in hand as though I were a, a cyclops, a one-eyed person, just like the camera, and try to walk around that scene, moving up and down, side to side, in and out, and throwing focus and watching the, what I term the juxtaposition, the essential differences, the things that, that give that scene character and balance and depth of field. During any typical exposure, you'll find uh, myself and my friend Ron Dixon running back okay. and forth Give just the around the back side of the camera, okay. tripping and stumbling, running for different odds and ends of unsundry different tools. We'll use things from cotton teased out of the smokestack to simulate smoke with a piece of black thread on a stick being jiggled like a Tom Sawyer with a fish on the end of the line. Uh, meanwhile, he's got his right hand over one of the lights trying to dodge one roof that's a little too warm. I've got my left hand on a piece of gel trying to get a little blue into the shadow for some fill for coolness. Picking up the flashlight and trying to open up those areas underneath the uh, carriage of the locomotive where all the, the light doesn't bounce into as it should. Meanwhile, somebody's still trying to keep track of how far we are through our one minute exposure. Did we start at 60 seconds or did we start at 30? And where do we go from there? So any one of those 
exposures it's quite a carnival and no two of them come out alike because there's so much uniqueness and spontaneity occurring during any one of them Ready? Um, the one thing that I really really appreciate that the finishing point the, the finality for me in model railroading is the photograph that I achieved through my secondary hobby of photography that allows me to so easily controllably share my enjoyment of model railroading through photography one of the more useful aspects of a telephoto lens is the compression effect. Now these two objects which I've set up here are in reality about five feet apart. So if I shoot them using a normal lens from this distance, they appear to be literally miles apart. However, if I change to a telephoto lens, simply take a couple of steps backward and refocus in the same perspective, they look to be almost right on top of one another. This is what you might call the use of the creative dimension of a telephoto lens, as opposed to using it simply to get up closer to an object. What photographer shot this famous 1907 bird's eye view of a German mansion? The picture was actually snapped by a pigeon who had the two and a half ounce camera strapped to her chest. The shot was automatically taken 30 seconds after the pigeon left her trainer's hands. An intrepid master of the early aerial photograph in the world of photography.